back when I was in seminary, I felt a lot of pressure to articulate what I believed in. This might seem odd for Unitarian Universalism, a tradition that is by definition multi-faith, non-credo, where we equally welcome Christians and atheists, Jewish folks, Muslim folks, and almost everyone else. But in seminary, there was a sense that you should know which one of these specific buckets you fell into. Are you one of those who believe in God and love spiritual experience? Or are you a humanist who enjoys the life of the mind? Or are you a Buddhist type with a meditation practice, diligently practiced every morning? The hope was, I know, to make sure that seminarians had thought about their beliefs, that they had some grounding in spirituality or religious theory, that they weren't sort of meandering around aimlessly. For me, though, in typical UU fashion, this all felt very limiting. I didn't like categories or being put into boxes. I was inspired by the compassion of Jesus, but also grounded by the practices of Buddhism. Humanism taught me the value of reason in religion, and I admired the living tradition of Judaism. Why couldn't that be enough, I thought. Now, my solution was to hold up the religious pluralism of Unitarian Universalism, to affirm that each person can, of course, be trusted to follow their own spiritual path. When people are encouraged to trust their hearts, they will find the life they seek. And my role is to simply speak to this human experience and support people on that path. Now, this is still an answer that I believe in, but it wasn't really the answer that people wanted for me back then. I didn't answer what I myself believed, what the roots of my spiritual inspiration were. Now, there are six commonly accepted Unitarian Universalist spiritual sources. It's a cheat sheet of sorts. Sources of theological inspiration and grounding. Here are the six. The world religions, our Judeo-Christian roots, are the prophetic words and deeds of people across time, earth-centered traditions, direct experiences of the transcendent and the humanistic tradition. Now, I've been thinking more about these sources and this question that in seminary folks wanted me to answer. What are your sources? What are your inspirations? Especially in light of the world as it is today. We have the electoral upheaval, the pandemic, the massive inequalities of our country. If there is ever a time for deeper spiritual grounding, this is it. The challenge has been that so much of what we used to rely on is now unavailable. We're not able to go to religious services like we used to. Maybe our yoga studio is closed. Or we're not able to take that meditation retreat that we used to every year. For me, the pandemic has had one spiritual, one major spiritual consequence. Unlike my seminarian self, I have become more comfortable naming the sources of my spirituality, especially that part that identifies with earth-centered traditions and practices. Now, I will admit that to some people, the phrase earth-centered spirituality conjures images of tree worshiping or from the 60s counterculture or, or maybe even something silly or heretical. In fact, my first experience with earth-centered spirituality, as I understood it then, was negative, even though it took place within a Unitarian Universalist religious education program. I was in middle school, and I was set to be enrolled in a program called OWL, Our Whole Lives, which takes a holistic and life-affirming look at sexuality and spirituality. Today, the program is revered and respected as a model of progressive education. Back in 1998, though, it was brand new and controversial, especially since it was done at church. And to complicate things, it was going to be taught at my church by a fairly intense pagan. One story she told us before the program started was how she made an annual pilgrimage to Indiana to worship the sun. And there she said she would see elves running and playing through the trees. 
And when I relayed this story to my parents, it became quickly apparent that I would not be taking OWL with this teacher. Her worldview was too unfamiliar for us then, shortly after we moved to a progressive Presbyterian church down the street. What's unfortunate, though, is that I was actually really primed to be into Earth-centered spirituality from a very young age. My family was always going through walks in the woods, in the prairies, in the beaches near our home. I loved playing outside in my yard, studying the various green things growing there, and even making it a mission to save drowning worms after a heavy rain. In high school, I helped lead the school's environmental group managing a native garden and installing birding stations around our campus. But it never occurred to me to tie those experiences to religion or spirituality. And by the time that I went to seminary, these commitments had largely been replaced by others. Now what is real and true in ourselves, I believe, though rarely remains buried forever. When we moved to New York City, some of my old nature-oriented self started to reemerge. I suspect two things were going on. The first was that here in the city, our concrete jungle, a real longing began to creep into my life for something natural, eternal, and timeless that withstands our human effort to control it. I felt the need to be connected to something wild that I could rely on beyond the hubbub and the noise and the chaos of our wonderful city here. The second thing that was happening was that I was settling into my adult life and settling with a job I enjoy, with a partner, with a home, invited me to reflect on my values and who I wanted to be and planned to be going forward. There's a looking back that happens to childhood or to earlier times that helps clarify that part in us that is truly ourselves, unsoiled by whatever expectations or demands life has laid on us since. And so I began walking more in various city parks. We got zoo memberships. When we left town, I tried to intentionally, intentionally visit more wild places. But what finally clarified things to me was the pandemic, because there's nothing like being stuck at home make you wish you could be outside. There's nothing like no longer being able to travel to your favorite natural places to make you miss them and realize how important they are. So I began somewhat without awareness to attempt to connect with the natural world as best I could from where I was right here. My wife and I began to make a real effort to celebrate the seasons, making food that used food that was of that time representative of that time of year and the holidays that it was part of. I began, like Ember, to pay attention to the moon, one of the few celestial bodies you can see here in the city and from my window. I learned that moons have names, that there are stories attached to those names, often based in indigenous traditions or agricultural cycles. We just passed the beaver moon, for example, a name that is based on the time that beavers take shelter in their lodges and rest for the winter. I learned I could mark the, full, the moon date on my calendar and look forward to it. Fourth Universalist itself and all of you have been vital in nurturing this growing awareness. It has meant something to me to be able to decorate our sanctuary or even have the excuse to decorate my little Zoom room here with seasonal decorations. It marks the passing of time the changes of seasons that we all go through. Even our equinoxes and solstice services have been a powerful way to honor not just the changing seasons, but the meaning behind those seasons. Just as Christian and Jewish the theologians read the Bible to ascertain the meaning and life lessons of those, we can do the same for the natural patterns of the earth, the moon and the stars and the seasons. What symbolism we can ask, does winter have? What lessons does it have to teach us? What kind of life does it ask us to live during that time that might be different than summer or spring or fall? 
These questions suggest a form of spirituality that is profound, that invites us to live in a relationship to the world around us, that is always changing, yet still comfortingly predictable. We know it is never winter forever, but that winter will always come. We are comforted by the pattern of this natural world because these patterns are ancient and eternal and that generations of human beings and animals and plants have lived through them all too. We know that spring will always bring new life. Winter will always invite us inward, no matter what is happening with our politics or our government. With each moment in time, we can live into the challenges of the world, focus our attention and practice on its lessons, all while buttressed by the nature around us. The chaos of this last year, so detached from normalcy, so unhinged from the past experiences that we've all had, it's forced me to look for what I can rely on, for what constancy I exist in this world. For me, that has meant the natural world, the seasons, the moon and the stars. From almost a year of this together, I am becoming confident and comfortable saying that I identify with Earth-centered spirituality, at least for one of my spiritual buckets. I think my mistake or hesitancy was to believe that such labels require some worship or deifying nature above all else in letting others define what Earth-centered spirituality was. The truth is that any spirituality, including Earth-centered spirituality, is all of ours to define because this is all our world. This is all our Earth that we call home. We can learn and love the trees and the wind and the moon in our own intimate way that gives us life. They offer transcendence and comfort and lessons. They connect us to the ancients and our ancestors and also to our descendants. They allow us to access the vastness of the universe while reminding us that we intimately belong. Naming my earth-centered spirituality has been powerful because in naming it, I have started to internalize it and emphasize it. It no longer becomes something just in my subconscious, but allows me to consciously integrate and make meaning of the world and the seasons around me, which are always there for me for all of us, no matter what. This is a real gift. And it can be a real gift for all of us, no matter what we believe. So ask yourself, what spiritual sources are bubbling up for you right now that need naming, that are giving you resiliency and meaning and hope during this strange and unprecedented time? How do they help make meaning for you right now. It's possible that like, like for me, for you, your sources are grounded in the natural world and the seasons around you, or maybe not. The beauty of, of Unitarian Universalism is that it doesn't have to be one thing or another, all of this or all of that, one thing forever. We are able to grow and learn and follow our own spiritual path, however we need it. I am just grateful to be able to do that with all of you here together, especially in these changing times with this beautiful world around us. May the sources of your inspiration nurture you now and always. May it be so and blessed be.